I've assembled the results into a number of key themes, so to speak. The first key theme is the idea that action in all these scenarios reduces the size of the Australian economy. Economists call economic size or relate economic size or measure economic size by real GDP. What drives this fall in real GDP? Well, it's convenient to look at the input side when considering these matters. By assumption, we assume that there is very little change in employment as a result of global action in the year 2050. So there's no source of GDP change from labour or from the employment component of the factors of production. But capital falls. Capital falls because the real cost of buying capital, purchasing capital to the employers, rises. That's one source of GDP decline. The other key source, and generally the largest of such sources, is the idea that abatement that's encouraged by the CO2 emissions price is not free, is not costless, but is a source of technological regress for the economy. In other words, it's costly. The numbers in the final area of this slide give you, in terms of percentage deviations from reference case, the reductions in real GDP associated with each scenario in the two key time periods, 2020 and 2050. And you'll see that the scenario for which we are focusing on, CPRS minus five, has real GDP falling by 1.1 and then 3.7% relative to where it otherwise would have been in 2050. The most stringent of scenarios has GDP declining by 1.6 per cent and 5.8 per cent in each of the key years. The second key theme relates to real income. Now, it's wrong to think real GDP is equivalent to real income. Real GDP is the value of capital income earned or produced in Australia. It's the value of income that comes from production in the Australian economy. But a lot of that income goes to overseas in terms of foreign ownership of capital, uh, unrequited remittances to uh, foreign workers and so forth. Hence, we use the term real gross national product or real income as our measure of true welfare for the Australian economy. And it turns out that real GNP or real income in Australia falls by more than does production or real GDP. There are three key reasons. Those permit purchases are one of the main reasons. As a result of these abatement uh, policies, we have to purchase permits from overseas. That's costly. All else unchanged, that means the real income accruing to us, Australia, falls by, Australians, fall by, falls by more than does real production. Then we have in our simulation results in terms of trade deterioration. We receive less for our exports with action in place than we do without action in place. And then, particularly for the CPRS scenarios in which we have, when Australia goes alone in those first 10 or so years, shielding of, of, um, of various trade exposed industries. Now, shielding is all about um, providing support through production subsidies or through the free allocation of permits to industries which are trade exposed and emissions intensive on the basis that if Australia goes alone, it's just unfair on those industries when competing overseas. Now, shielding has to be funded. It's funded by Australians. But the problem with shielding is that many of the companies being shielded have large foreign ownership shares. So to the extent that some of the CPRS or some of the policies revenue goes to shielding, 
income goes overseas. So real GNP overall falls by more than real GDP, and the numbers in the slide um, uh, explain that. Does the GDP effect make sense? Of course it does. Next slide. Right, no. huh? When I come to a, um, a forum like this or uh, speak to people uh, on, on a consultancy basis or private companies that use our services, they're often surprised. They consider at these uh, emission prices that the economy will be decimated, right? Not a fall of 1 or 2 per cent relative to where it otherwise would have been, but falls of 30, 40, 50 per cent. This fall in real GDP of 3.7 or at most 6 per cent can be interpreted as meaning that instead of the Australian economy growing at, say, 2.8 per cent per annum, it grows at rates of around 2.6 per cent per annum. Clearly, this is not a policy that has decimated the Australian economy. So where does this number, what gives us confidence in these type of numbers as opposed to the minus 30, minus 40, the minus 50 per cent? Well, here is a couple of what we call stylized uh, or back of the envelope um, calculations. The first, and you'll just have to trust me on this, is that a back of the envelope calculation suggests that 0.6 times the burden of any tax is roughly what you would expect to be as the reduction in real GDP arising from that tax. These CPRS and Gano policies are effectively carbon taxes. And so applying that idea at a permit price of $115 to reference case levels of emissions of over 1,000 million tonnes to GDP in 2050 suggests that the burden that attacks 0.6 of that burden is around 2.9 per cent. That compares to 3.7 per cent actually projected for the decline in GDP. So that gives us confidence that we're in the ballpark, at least in the context of our type of model. But there's other facts that give us such confidence as well. What about the electricity sector? It emits a huge proportion of Australia's emissions, about 36 per cent currently. Yet it represents only about 3 per cent of the Australian economy. We don't get rid of the electricity se sector. It shrinks as electricity demand falls, but it only shrinks by around 12 per cent in the CPRS minus 5 scenario by 2050. It's certainly reshapen, as we'll see shortly, away from conventional coal generation towards renewable generation. But there you see huge scope for reductions in generation with comparatively little economic impact. And then there's range, uh, ranges of abatement possibilities assumed in our modelling for forestry and for, uh, for agriculture, which are available apparently at relatively cheap costs. Key theme three is that action reduces production in some industries, obviously, but it expands production in others. What happens to the price of emissions is certainly not the only factor. What happens to global demand is a key factor in these global scenarios. What happens to exchange rates and hence international competitiveness is another factor. The ability to shift towards low technology, oh, sorry, low emission technologies, the emission intensity and what happens to domestic demand are all factors that need to be taken into account when looking at the impacts of a emissions trading strategy or mitigation policy for industry output. There's two panels here. The first panel shows percentage deviations from reference case value in production of certain industries. The second panel shows the level of production indexed to the level in 2008. Listed here is what happens to, in our simulations, aluminium production. That's in the dark blue. And if you go to the left-hand side of the first panel, you'll see that production in that industry is projected to fall by around 50 per cent. 
relative to where it otherwise would have been. But if you look to the right-hand panel and, after taking into account growth potential through the reference case, you will see that production of aluminium in 2050 is very little changed from its level in 2008. The same applies to conventional or, more generally, coal-fired generation. It falls relative to base by about 60 per cent in terms of production. But such is its growth in the reference case, the level of production in 2050 is not too different from the level of production in 2008. As time moves on, we'll skip some of the uh, more detail or detailed elements of these slides. We can come back to them um, in question. This slide shows the projected mix of, renewable, of electricity generation in the CPRS minus five projection alone. You can see in terms of terawatt or terawatt hours, I think that's uh, the term, that initially Australian electricity generation is dominated by black coal power, around about 118 terawatt hours, by brown coal power, which adds another 60 terawatt hours. And then comes a mix of gas, a little bit of oil and renewable generation, currently dominated by hydro generation. In our scenarios, we assume that there is no additional hydro generation possibility. So hydro generation stays more or less static, both in the reference and in the alternative emission constrained cases. Now go over to the picture for 2050. Virtually no conventional coal generation, black or brown, is being projected. Instead, what we see is a rise in carbon capture and storage black coal generation, as given by that light blue. Continued growth in gas generation, but by far the largest gain in renewable generation, not hydro, non-hydro. And the main source of that increased renewable generation is not wind, it's geothermal. I've always been a little bit surprised by that. Reading uh, science books of about 10 years ago, tidal, geothermal seemed to be almost science fiction. Tidal might still be, but geothermal certainly is not. And the MMA, McLennan Magasanic Associate numbers suggest that we will see very significant amounts of geothermal generation in all scenarios by the year 2050. There's also some carbon and capture and storage gas generation, and that's a mainly, mainly occurring in uh, WA. Time slips by. Forestry. Another source of abatement is forestry sequestration. This slide is in thousands of hectares and, and shows for the CPRS minus five case, accumulated land, new land, sown to forestry between now and the year 2050. In the most stringent of scenarios, we have around 40,000 hectares, no, 40, 000, 40 million hectares more of forestry than is currently in place. The less stringent scenarios has around 10 million hectares of forestry, new plantation forestry. What that means is essentially that forestry output in the less stringent cases increased by about 150 per cent relative to reference case levels, while in the more severe cases it increases by approximately 600 per cent relative to reference case levels in the year 2050. A lot of abatement through forestry sequestration. What about the road transport fuel mix? This is an interesting picture because in contrast to the electricity generation mix where we saw lots of action happening, shifts away from conventional coal and gas towards CCS and renewables, here the picture is much more muted. The dark area is petrol and various petrol blends with ethanol. The green area is diesel 
and a number of diesel blends. And you'll see that most of the road transport task now is fuelled by diesel and petrol, and that is expected to remain the case through to 2050. One of the key developments starting by 2050 is the use of electricity only vehicles. You will see that about 100 petajoules of fuel from electricity or attributed to electricity is being used in the road transport task. If I expanded this uh, diagram for the Garno scenarios out to 2075, you will see that about 75 per cent of all road transport fuel use is electricity in both the Garno minus um, 10 and minus 25 scenarios. So while not obvious here, electricity starts to play a very big part as we go to the extrema of these scenarios. But the key message is electricity generation, a lot of action. Transport, at least based on what CSIRO, what the government departments tell us, have little, relatively little abatement possibilities over the next 30 or 40 years. Action produces a mixed story for states, and I'll almost finish on this point. Energy-oriented states such as, as you see in the light blue Queensland and in the khaki green WA, lose GSP relative to reference case levels. Remember, real GDP falls by 3.7. So the GSP in those states falls by more. Hence, they lose activity relative to the rest of Australia. Tasmania and South Australia by this time have very little energy concentration in their economies by the year 2050, hence they're shown as gaining activity share. Action increases, increases electricity prices to final customers. We see in the most stringent of uh, cases, the Garno 25 in the year 2050, that retail electricity prices have gone up by 51 per cent relative to where they otherwise would have been. That number 456 under Garno 10 is wrong. It should be from memory a number like 36 per cent. That's an error of mine. What's interesting about this slide is that it does not show 200, 300, 400 per cent numbers as is often quoted in the press. Why is that? One reason is that retail electricity has, as a share, only about 30 per cent of generated electricity. In other words, the retail electricity that we buy has, in terms of costs, only about 30 per cent of generation. The rest is associated with um, uh, costs of labour in terms of getting the electricity from the generator to the retail point of final demand. The other point is that electricity by the year 2050 is very clean. Right? It consists mainly of renewable generation and CCS technology produced coal and gas generation. So the increases in retail price of electricity in both the Garno and Treasury world are mild compared to what some people have reported. Right, conclusions. Taking action on greenhouse has an economic cost. It's not a benefit. It definitely has an economic cost. Size of the cost depends on the amount of abatement, the amount of abatement required, and on the permit price imposed. Size of the cost depends on the efficiency of the uh, policy to bring into play low costs and efficient abatement technologies. But it should be noted, as I uh, mentioned before, that the economy continues to grow strongly or at rates well above population growth, even in the most stringent scenarios where the permit price by 2050 reaches $250. Some industries lose, others gain relative to reference case levels. But as we saw in those slides, nearly all industries produce more in the year 2050 than they do in the year 2008, including almost aluminium and conventional, or not conventional, but coal generation.
Just like there's a mixed story for industries, there's a mixed story for states. My final slide, one more thought. This analysis is very much long-running focus. This is one of the key, I think, criticisms that could be directed towards the Ghana and Treasury work, in that it does not take into account or even make an effort to account for the adjustment costs early on. There are significant changes in output for industries. There are significant changes in uh, regional industrial compositions. And those changes entail, will entail very large adjustment costs. Things like retraining and relocation regionally of labour. Adjustment costs associated with downtime as new investment, abatement friendly investment replaces existing capacity. There will be plant closures in various areas, plants opening up, etc., etc. Very real short-term costs that are not accounted for in the modelling, the results of which I've just quoted. Um, Owen. Yep. Um, Philip will take some questions. We, we don't have a very long time, so it would be good if we had questions rather than statements, but um, we do have time for questions. Um, carbon pollution is one aspect of um, sustainability, but the other is resource depletion. So mm. I always hear economists talk, and I'm not an economist, talking about economic growth as if it goes on forever, but the earth is finite. There are only so many resources that we can use, and in, I think, 1986, we actually started going into deficit in terms of our um, natural capital. So. How can we have unlimited growth in finite growth in a finite world? Well, we can't, right? In short, the big question is, when do those limitations start to take place? And it's, uh, it's a very important question, especially when going to 2100. Right? Let me tell you, at least for Australia, what happens to natural resources in our uh, modelling. Coal faces no supply constraints through to 2100. Gas from conventional uh, sources disappears in Queensland, um, South Australia, South Australia by 2015, Victoria from the large Bass Strait fields by 2035. Some of that gas is replaced by coal seam methane supplied gas from Queensland fields, which supplies most of eastern Australian gas needs through to about 2055. Then, gas destined for export markets in WA and the Northern Territory are diverted to meet Australia's gas requirements to about 2100, the end of the analysis, thankfully. A lot of the uh, supply depletion that we would see without action does not, uh, does not occur because action, is being, uh, action on greenhouse is taking place. Right? The carbon and capture storage technologies um, seem to save the electricity coal generation industry from oblivion, but its production still falls away relative to reference case quite sharply. Oil production in Australia disappears, um, I don't know, very early on, and we don't have much call on conventional oil sources uh, um, elsewhere through the remainder of the period to 2100. Right? That fuel mix story for road transport suggests that there will be continued strong growth in demand for diesel and uh, petrol, and hence for oil. But it was only the mixed story. The overall demand for petrol and uh, other oil-based fuels is falling through the mitigation scenarios, falling at a rate of around 0.2 um, or 0.3 per cent per year. So yes, we've thought about it. Right, especially since we're having to go out to 2,100. We've made realistic assumptions, uh, but it's yeah, always a key issue. Right? And the G10 modelling has oil prices growing quite significantly, not from current well, levels of uh, two or three months ago, but to about $100 a, um, US dollars a barrel in real terms, that is in prices of 2007 by the year 2050. Again, a supply constraint story. Um, could you tell us uh, the, the source of the, 
or the authoritative statement of the climate change problem? Is it the Google search or, or is it a particular document? If so, which is it? Uh, um, well, it's the Google search of many uh, documents, uh, right? The authoritative statement was not to, meant to be an authoritative statement, right? It was a statement of belief that underlies my interest in this um, uh, climate uh, change policy. The title of the paper talks of insurance, right? Insurance is all about risk and uncertainty. And I fully admit there's a huge amount of risk and uncertainty associated with the climate change science, things I don't understand, and that as scientists themselves don't understand. Right? But there certainly seems a consensus in scientific circles that there is a non-zero probability that surface temperatures are rising, etc., etc., and that it's human-induced climate change that is driving. Now, given that there is a non-zero possibility that it occurs, it makes it reasonable to think or to conjecture that Australia and other economies should be putting in place policies or buying insurance to cover the potential costs of catastrophic effects if they were to occur, even if they are of small possibility. I don't know the probability levels. I don't know those possibility levels. But as long as they're greater than zero, then that justifies statements along the lines that I put up before and justifies the government's action and justifies our interest in the topic. You mentioned that uh, forest sequestration will play a major role in carbon reduction. Will we have enough water to grow all those forests? Well, according to the experts that have provided this information to us and the experts that we use, a great lump of that forest, so thank you very much. forest occurs or is planted in areas of WA, particularly in southern WA in the central and eastern areas. Right? And it's very much dry land forestry plantings of types that I couldn't tell you, right? but I can give you relevant uh, references and the land use experts that were advising the Federal Treasury, uh, this was their view, and uh, that's the view that we've uh, adopted. I'm certainly no expert on forest, but it must be that uh, they consider that there is sufficient water in those areas to support such forestry and such new forestry plantations. Of interest, of course, is that one hectare more of forestry means, in general, one hectare less of agriculture, which is an important consideration in our modelling, particularly of the agricultural sector. Yeah. Um, on behalf of the faculty and on behalf of Monash, I have a very small presentation for Philip, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.